my friend Dave Redden from down in Washington County and Kerry Sims over in uh, Angelina County. So welcome to both you guys. And I guess we'll get started. And, and what I want to visit with you about is, uh, I guess we'll call it three basic considerations when we're thinking about managing either introduced forage pastures or even rangeland. So I, I hate to get out there <laughs> onto Megan's turf, but uh, in my world, it, it kind of all blends together. And a lot of our producers have both introduced uh, and rangeland. So we'll, we'll start with those three aspects and we'll kind of uh, drill down a little deeper as we talk about each of those. So I want to first talk to you a little bit about where we stand statewide with the, the drought monitor map. And this was the most recent one that I could download uh, off the USDA site. And you can see that, you know, by and large, the state looks pretty good right now. But if you look under that yellow classification right there, it says currently We've got over 40%, uh, almost 41% of the state is abnormally dry. And I think they're really sort of behind there because we've got some uh, parts of the state that have not had much rain over the last 60, uh, 70 days. We had a lot of rain uh, through winter, early spring, up through uh, the Memorial Day weekend. And some people, certainly in the Blanco River Basin, would say that we had too much. But since that time, it has sort of dried up and, and it got hot, uh, got dry. And so a lot of our pastures, whether they're rangeland or, or introduced forage pastures, are not looking real, real good right now. So if we look at the, the seasonal outlook from USDA again, and this is supposed to be valid through October 31st, uh, we look good. Western United States is still suffering under the kind of drought that uh, that we suffered under 2011, but, you know, if they're right, uh, then maybe, and, and we're told that we're under El Nino uh, right now, so uh, hopefully we're going to have a little bit more moisture during the fall and winter, and certainly that bodes well for a lot of, a lot of the state. Just as a reminder, this is what we looked like uh, back in 2011, and that's, that's just about as bad as it can be. Uh, I'm told that uh, since we started keeping records in Texas in 1885, I believe it is, uh, we have not seen a year, one single year that was as bad as 2011. So uh, don't want to go there again uh, and, and glad that that's behind us. So, you know, compared to where we were then, we certainly look pretty good, but currently we are drying up. So if you look at uh, the drought uh, timeline there, uh, and I don't think the animation is going to show, maybe, yeah, well, okay, there we go. So this current dry cycle, and it's not a surprise to the climatologists. They, they've seen this, they understand it, they know the duration. They tell us that the current dry cycle that we're in started in 1995, and it's projected to last until about 2020. Doesn't mean that we won't have some periods where we have a little higher levels of precipitation. Uh, the summer of 2007 was uh, very wet. We had a hard time getting into the hay fields because it rained so often. And up through Memorial Day weekend, we had sort of that same situation. But uh, at least the climatologists are telling us not to get uh, not to get too happy too quickly because we've still got several years. It looks like before we come out of this dry cycle. If we think back to 2011, we think about drought and how that impacts uh, what we do with hay production, livestock production. Um, if we're talking about how well the quail are going to do in one year or another, how well uh, deer antlers are going to uh, be made manifest during that growing season, it's all tied to rainfall. And so this is a shot uh, in 2011 of a hay storage barn, and you can see just what that looked like. There was absolutely no hay to be had. Uh, in most of the state of Texas that year, most of the hay that was fed came from out of state. And if you'll look, the only thing green in that picture besides the John Deere tractor uh, are weeds. This is another problem that we run into uh, when our only source of water uh, for our livestock is surface water. Uh, we can wind up in some pretty bad shape when that water dries up. Uh, Hopefully, by this time, uh, people would have destocked and gotten rid of cattle, but a lot of people tend to want to hang on 
and if this is their only source of water, then they really get into trouble, and they can get into trouble uh, pretty pretty badly because you can haul feed, although it's not economically viable uh, under most circumstances. Hauling water, uh, the fun runs out of that pretty darn quickly. So if we talk about how drought affects forages, uh, we know that, and it's it's kind of a no-brainer. We know that we get uh, reduced above ground growth. And I'm showing this old SCS uh, drawing that really relates to utilization by grazing livestock. But the same thing uh, happens with drought. If we reduce the above ground growth, <coughs> excuse me, then that leads to reduced root development. So if we don't have the, the green tops on top, we don't have the roots being developed underneath, then that has a negative feedback. We have uh, a reduction, a further reduction in above ground growth. And what that eventually leads to is either dormancy or death. Typically, our warm season perennial grasses, rangeland, Bermuda grass, if it's well fertilized, uh, they can usually tolerate a pretty good degree of drought. And sometimes they'll go dormant and come right back when we start getting rainfall. But if you think back to the drought of 2011, it was so severe that we lost a lot of uh, native perennial grasses. We lost a lot of uh, perennial introduced warm season forages. Uh, we were even killing red berry juniper out on the plateau. So it, it was a devastating drought. And so that's kind of a no brainer, but another look at how drought impacts root production. And I think that top uh, plant is the, is the most vivid. You can see that uh, under normal conditions we've got a lot more root uh, growth, a lot more root production because we've got more tops, more photosynthetic material leading to the formation of more roots. Under the drought scenario we don't have near as much in the way of root production. Of course again if we don't have the roots we can't exploit the soil profile looking for moisture and nutrients so again has that negative feedback back to the top of the plant. So there'll be a little quiz later. Everybody take notes because uh, we'll be talking about the Calvin cycle. And I know, Megan, you're ready for that. But, you know, when we look at what all goes into photosynthesis, there's, there's several, I mean, there's a lot of aspects of that. But there's four things primarily that we think in terms of. We think in terms of carbon uh, dioxide. It's in the atmosphere. It's everywhere. Uh, we really don't have a lot of control over how much carbon dioxide the plant gets. It's just there. But we also need uh, solar radiation. That's the light. And so I, I ask people all the time, do we as managers have any impact on how much light reaches our, our forage plants? And sort of the gut reaction, knee-jerk response is, no, I can't control that. But we'll talk later and maybe I can demonstrate how we actually can and do control how much light reaches the plant. We have water. Water is very important in that process. And I ask the same question, you know, can we as managers impact how much water the plant gets? And most everybody will say, no, think about 2011 drought. We, you know, we couldn't control that. But I think maybe I'll show you uh, using some data that the Rain Science Guys put together several years ago that we actually can uh, sort of ma manipulate and manage uh, how much water that our plants get. Uh, and then finally, that the color of that chloroplast there is green. And the question I ask people uh, many times is, can we as managers have an impact on how much photosynthetic material is out there? And I think the answer is ob obviously yes. And we'll look at some more of that as we go through uh, the rest of the presentation. So the first factor, and that's kind of what we've led up to with all the discussion about drought and effect on roots and that sort of thing, is that if we don't have water, then all bets are off. It, it doesn't matter really what you do uh, as far as your forage management. Uh, if you're not getting the water, if it's 2011, or if we're in a situation like we are currently where we haven't had any rainfall, in much of the state now for the last 60, 70 days or so, uh, if you're not getting the water, it's, it's difficult to do anything as far as management. Typically, we're thinking about destocking and, and pulling back some of those animals so that we don't impact uh, the forage uh, 
uh, resource or the environment any more than we have to. So that leads us to the second aspect. And this primarily relates to either A, Bermuda grass, uh, doesn't matter what you're doing with Bermuda grass. If we don't fertilize Bermuda grass, if we don't fertilize Bermuda grass well, then Bermuda grass will not stay with us. It goes away. And so uh, if we have Bermuda grass, uh, on the one hand, uh, it's a, a plant that can be very, very responsive to fertilizer. Uh, it can support a fairly heavy stocking rate. It's fairly resilient in its uh, ability to tolerate abuse. Uh, but without fertilizer, it, it can't do any of those, those things for us. The other aspect is no matter what you're cutting for hay, you simply must fertilize because any kind of a hay harvest is a mining operation. We are mining great quantities of nutrients out of the soil and hauling those nutrients somewhere else. So Mother Nature put those nutrients in the soil. There's a finite level of those nutrients. And in a hay operation, if we don't pay careful attention to what we're doing, uh, we can take a site that's very, very productive and reduce the productive capability of that site. And it doesn't take a long time to do that. So if we're talking about fertilizer nutrients, and uh, I hate to show this picture because it is such a good looking guy in that picture. Uh, I know that Megan is probably just, you know, beside herself right now looking at that. <laughs> Sorry about that, Megan. I had to say that. But anyway, so the question I ask people when I show them this picture is, I yeah, Megan, okay, thank you for the comment. Uh, so I ask people, so what am I doing? And... You know, most people look and say, well, you checking all. I say, yeah, that's that's true. And I'm glad to hear people say that because I showed that picture to a group of about 60 one night and nobody knew what I was doing. And it kind of scared me a little bit. I thought they were all friends of my daughter. But having said that, yeah, we're checking all. It's a very, very simple concept that has very, very profound implications. So we've got this simple piece of metal, and when we look at that piece of metal, it tells us two critically important uh, pieces of information about that engine. Number one, do I have enough oil in the crankcase to get the job done, to run that engine, to motor up and down the highway? And the second piece of information we get from that dipstick is if I don't have enough oil in the crankcase, it tells me how much to put in really simple concept and yet very very profound in its consequences if we don't pay attention to that so when we start talking about fertility then we have to talk about the soil test and the soil test is nothing more than the dipstick for our soils our soil scientists here in the department would be horrified to hear me say that you know they've spent their whole career trying to make this really complex and difficult to understand but the reality of it is that's all the soil test is is it tells us two important pieces of information number one do i have enough nutrients in the ground to get the job done and if i don't have enough nutrients then the soil test will tell me what i need to apply and so if we don't do a soil test and we still have a lot of producers that will just simply call up the fertilizer dealer and say bring me out some fertilizer, bring me out 300 pounds per acre, 500 pounds per acre. They never think about, you know, okay, what quantity of nutrients am I asking to be brought to my place? Am I over applying? Am I under applying? Uh, the simple truth is without the soil test, we can never get the right amount of fertilizer nutrients in the soil. And nutrients today are very, very expensive. One of the things that we look at with Bermuda grass uh, is we think in terms of water use efficiency. So if I don't fertilize my Bermuda grass, hay, uh, hay meadow, if I don't fertilize that right, then it takes a whole lot more moisture, a whole, whole lot more water in the soil to produce a ton of Bermuda grass versus if I fertilize it like it should be, which for each of our hay harvests, we'll think in terms of 100 pounds of nitrogen being applied for every cutting 
then that can dramatically reduce the amount of water that it takes to produce a ton of dry matter. So, you know, from standpoint of, of being more drought tolerant, producing the roots, and being able to export the soil profile, look for moisture, look for nutrients, all those kinds of things, it's just very, very important that we soil test and apply these fertilizer nutrients to Bermuda grass anytime and hay meadows always so that we get the right kind of response that we'd like to get out of the hay meadow. Now a lot of people have looked at the cost of fertilizer over the last several years and decided that maybe they didn't want to be in a production system that required a lot of fertilizer inputs and that's okay. I mean uh, right now calves are selling for enough that we can actually justify the cost of fertilizer uh, in these uh, production systems, but there will be a time when calf prices won't be able to support that again. And so a lot of people have looked at, you know, from Interstate 45 all the way to the Atlantic seaboard, a lot of people have decided to quit fighting Bahia grass and, and use that and for grazing and or hay production. If you fertilize it, it can make a fairly good hay crop for you. But for grazing bahia grass or klein grass or some of the old world blue stems, uh, notably WWB doll old world blue stem, and certainly the native forages have the ability to be very, very persistent under low input management uh, regimes. And so for just grazing, uh, a lot of these other forages can and, and will work very well in production system for livestock. And then there's this, this whole move of native prairie restoration. We've got a lot of people that are interested in coming out of introduced forages that were not native to Texas, and they're more interested in restoring these native prairies. And there's a lot of interest in that. There's a lot of people engaged in that. And so one of the main reasons that people are looking at that is to improve wildlife habitat. We can never recreate the prairie uh, like it was. But the thing is, is that the more uh, plant species diversity we have, likely the more wildlife species diversities we're also going to have at that site. And one of the big drivers of this right now is northern Bob White. There's a lot of people that are interested, and I've asked them, are you interested in bringing back huntable populations? And they tell me, no, we just want to hear them. We grew up hearing those uh, Bob Whites calling in the spring, and we'd like to be able to hear them again, and we don't, we don't hear them. So... Uh, a lot of interest in going back to native forages. And so, uh, Pete, I didn't, I don't know how you want to handle this. You were going to kind of poll the audience a little bit, so I'll turn that over to you for a moment. There should be a poll a pop up on the screen. Just uh, vote. Uh, the question is there, and then just vote to your answer or multiple answers. Can you see the votes, Dr. Redmond? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. It's pretty interesting seeing how uh, the, the tally is coming in there. And some were paying attention and some not as much. So is that about it? Yes, sir. All right. So let's briefly discuss that, the amount of sunlight the plant receives. Yes, we mentioned that a while ago, and I'm going to talk about how we actually impact how much sunlight the plant uh, receives. We have nothing to do with the CO2 the plant receives, but we do have impact on how much water and how much photosynthetic material uh, that the plant has out there, and we're going to, we're going to talk about that as we go on through this. So thus far, we've talked about the need for water. It's a no-brainer. We've talked about in any kind of a hay production scenario, or if we have Bermuda grass as our forage base, uh, we're going to need to soil test and apply those nutrients in, in the right quantities so that we get the response that we'd like to get out of that pasture. But then we need to talk about protection uh, of the forage base. And I think this is many times where people maybe don't quite put all that together. And so, uh, have we gone over this? Have, did, did I show this earlier, Pete? 
I just want to make sure I didn't I didn't want to repeat myself, yes, but although I am repeating myself because I want everybody to firmly get a hold of this concept in that light, water, the color, that green uh, photosynthetic material, CO2, those are all very, very critical components. And three of the four we as managers have direct control over. So let's talk about weeds. And so when we think about weed pressure in the pasture, and there's a great fence line cons or shot right there. Uh, it's kind of interesting. On the right hand side is my pasture. And on the left side is Dave Redden's down in Washington County. And so Dave hasn't quite figured out how to use herbicides yet. So anyway, that's a great fence line contrast. And if you look at that on the left hand side, so the question is, who's getting the sunlight? And the answer is obviously the weeds. It's not the grass underneath. The grass underneath has this canopy of weeds on top. The weeds are acting like umbrellas. They're catching all the sunlight or most of the sunlight. And so we actually do impact how much sunlight reaches our forage base by looking at the amount of weed and or brush that we allow to take over a pasture. So if we let the left hand side become the norm for us, we're no longer in the grass growing uh, business. We're actually in the weed, broadleaf weed uh, growing condition or situation. And you know, if that is part of what you're trying to accomplish, let's say that uh, all that woolly croton right there in the in the lower part of that photo, if you're trying to manage for uh, woolly croton so that you can then charge people $200 a day to come out from Dallas or Houston or somewhere to hunt doves, that's a totally different goal. But if our goal is to grow grass, manage pastures, run livestock, then we can't tolerate that kind of weed pressure. And so uh, when we have that canopy on top, we're not allowing the sunlight, the solar radiation that's so critical for photosynthesis to get down to uh, our forage plants like we need for that sunlight to, to do. If you look at what it costs to control those weeds, a lot of people like to shred. I almost cannot even utter the words uh, because shredding costs us more money. Uh, not only does it cost us more money, but it really doesn't control the weeds. I often ask people, so if you have ever mowed a field full of goat weed, raise your hand. Most hands in the audience will go up. And I always follow up and ask them, say, okay, so what did the field look like in two to three weeks? And they said, well, it looks like a field full of goat weed. And so the question is, how much uh, real control did I achieve by mowing? I don't. I don't do any control hardly at all. Uh, if we're in a drought situation, we've got that weed canopy, and I showed you one of those early photos at Empty Hay Barn, how the only thing green in the pasture was the weeds. Weeds can tolerate drought very well. They can thrive during drought. And if you've got a big weed canopy out there and it's real droughty, you may be forced to mow and keep that canopy knocked off so that there's some sunlight getting down to your grass so that the weeds are not transpiring and using up all the moisture, the limited moisture that's in that site. But if you've got pretty good growing conditions, then the herbicide is the way to go because it's going to be much more cost effective and it will actually it will actually allow you to achieve some control over that weed population out there uh, in in the pasture. We need to think about protection from winter pasture. We we talk a lot this Saturday. I'll be down at Producers Co-op talking to them about winter pasture production. I was in Washington County the other night talking about winter pasture production. Uh, this is the time of year everybody starts thinking about overseeding pasture uh, with either ryegrass or one of the small grains or maybe a forage legume if we're east of Interstate 35. But look at the photo that I'm showing you there. Uh, this is from a dry spring year of 2000. This is a guy's uh, long-term coastal Bermuda grass field in June of 2000. And you can see there's very little green in that pasture and the way this guy was able to destroy his Bermuda grass was by not removing, not utilizing the winter pasture and getting rid of it in a timely manner. So it's kind of like having weeds there. If you've got a big winter pasture crop and you don't utilize that and get it off, 
uh, at the right time of the year, then it's the same thing. It's going to rob the plants of sunlight, nutrients, moisture, and I have seen not just one, not just two, not just a dozen fields where people have actually destroyed their warm season perennial grass from failure to remove their winter pasture. So we need to think in terms of when the nighttime temperatures are consistently 60 degrees or better, warm season perennial grass starts to make active growth. And so when we start to get to that point, we need to have removed all that winter pasture. Best way to remove is just be grazing it, grazing it heavily so that we can use it up and we'll, we're going to plant it again this coming fall. But we need to use it up. We can bale it. Sometimes it's a little more difficult to bale in that late winter, early spring time frame because it's a little cooler, it's a little cloudier, sometimes it's raining. Uh, so sometimes baling uh, is a little difficult. But uh, having said that, we need to remove and protect that underlying forage base from that winter pasture because we can destroy. So talk about protection from grasshoppers. We've had lots and lots of grasshopper uh, pressure over the last several years. Grasshoppers really thrive under dry conditions. They're fungal uh, predators that help to control their population uh, or not as prevalent during the dry year. And so there's a lot of different products there that we can use, and a lot of us have used. Uh, Demolin has been around for a few years. It, you know, uh, was first released for rangeland and pasture, and so uh, we've had that for a while. Malathion, 7XLR, Mustang, Tombstone, Lambside, all those have been around a long, long time. Sort of the new kid on the block is a DuPont product called Prevathon. And the thing that is interesting about Prevathon is if you think about pesticides, and it doesn't matter which pesticide you're thinking about. If you're thinking about an insecticide, or a rodenticide, or a fungicide, or a herbicide, or whatever, there's, there's always one of three different signal words on that label. And that signal word indicates potential toxicity to humans. So if you look at some products, uh, that lowest level signal word would say caution. And that would, you know, they would probably say maybe be sure and wash your hands with soap and water after handling the product or whatever. Uh, the next level up signal word would be warning. That indicates it has a little more potential to cause you some problems. And so there may be some additional personal protection equipment listed or, or something like that. But then we get to these higher uh, level signal word and it's, it's called danger. And so we really have to be careful with some of those products because as in the case of say a raid ant and roach spray that you may have under the kitchen sink at the house, that can be very, very toxic, very lethal for humans. And so when you look at Prevathon, Prevathon is the first pesticide not to require a signal word on its label. So it's extremely safe for humans, for livestock, uh, whatever it might be, pets. Uh, I'm told that although it, it's uh, devastating on uh, grasshoppers, it does not impact pollinators like bees and, and those kinds of things. So that's good news for them. Uh, the other thing about Prevathon is that it has some pretty good residual uh, activity out there in the field. And I'll show you a data slide here in just a little bit. It had a great video, but it wouldn't play in Adobe Connect, so I'm not going to try to show that. But um, the data indicates that we have seen some really good residual as long as four weeks after application. And Roy Parker, the retired entomologist from Corpus Christi, uh, saw impacts even as far as eight weeks after application. So will the label guarantee you eight weeks? No. But can you expect some pretty good residual? The answer is yes. And why that's important is, let's say today you go out and you treat uh, a field full of grasshoppers with lambda psi. And every, every grasshopper that you touch with that lambda psi droplet is going to die. But tomorrow it doesn't have any impact. So if the grasshoppers from your neighbor's place tomorrow decide to move into your place, 
you haven't accomplished a lot. You killed all the ones that were in your field, but you didn't have any impact on the others. They're going to move in. So Prevathon can help provide some additional protection for that forage. And if you think about, and we're going to talk about grazing livestock, grasshoppers are just like having a bunch of cows out there. It's like having a heavy stocking rate because they're going to be stripping all the photosynthetic material off of your plants. And with no photosynthetic material, the plant is not going to be able to, to produce those roots that are so critical for survival, especially during these dry taps. So um, the way the Prevathon works, it's, a, it's not a contact insecticide. It's a systemic that moves into the plant. And when the, the grasshopper takes a bite of the plant, uh, this Prevathon freezes up their jaw muscles. They're unable to feed. The damage is uh, stopped immediately. And then they starve to death over the next few days. So, you know, when you start looking, you know, products like Malathon that has grazing restrictions and blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, or the safety of the humans who may consume the grazing animal. Yeah, it, it's all about uh, the animal. It's about the animal. And the Malathon is really... You know, it's it's pretty darn safe. And so Stephen was asking that question, you know, is it about, you know, the animal or is it about somebody that may consume later? And so not familiar with the residue studies that they've done on that, but I suspect it's just because of, of the animal that's going to be in there grazing. Prevathon has only, I think, a is it a four-hour restriction? It's, it's really short. It's basically no grazing or hay restrictions at all. So... From a safety standpoint and an efficacy standpoint, Prevathon is really an excellent product. So if you look here, here's some data out of Austin County. Uh, again, Roy Parker and uh, Philip Shackelford, who was county extension agent there. And you can see that, you know, this is four weeks after application. And so, you know, just an outstanding product. It's one of those products that actually works like they say it will. You know, so many times we get a lot of hype and, and publicity about stuff, and it doesn't really work like they said. Uh, this stuff actually works just like they say it will. Strange thing about it, it was actually introduced for worms. And so when we're thinking about fall army worm protection, same thing applies. Uh, we can use this in the pasture and get not only good control of the fall army worm, but also... Uh, have that residual activity that we're looking for uh, out there in the pasture. So, uh, again, a great product that actually does the job. We've got a new problem in our Bermuda grass. Uh, I say new, a lot of people may not be aware of it. It's called a Bermuda grass stem maggot. And that photo doesn't really do justice. But what happens is uh, fly lays egg. Uh, egg hatches, little larva crawls into the stem of the Bermuda grass and kills the topmost portion of the plant. And so the, the, the field has kind of this frosted top look. It kind of looks like, you know, maybe it's a drought effect or something like that. But it's a, it's a stem maggot. And so this is something that just showed up in 2010 over in Georgia. And by 2012, we had it. And uh, now it's being reported in most of the state where Bermuda grass has grown. So if you look at that little uh, orange looking fly there, uh, it's only an eighth of an inch long. And so looking for the flies uh, and trying to scout the field, you have to really get out there out of the pickup, get off the county road and get out there in the field and actually look for these flies and uh, that's uh, that lower right is a, a photo of the stem maggot larva and those black marks are 1 16th inch lines and so that little guy is only about an 8 to uh, 3 16ths of an inch long so and the thing is he's inside the stem and so you can't see him doing his work you can just see the aftermath and see that dead top so the treatment and it's not really a treatment, it's just kind of a management deal, uh, is to use the lowest labeled rate of any of the pyrethroid type products. So that would be your tombstone, your lambda side, those kinds of things. 
uh, you can use the lowest labeled rate and treat for the fly. Uh, there can be multiple generations. You can see on the right hand side, uh, retired agent uh, Joe Yannick down in Victoria County. Uh, you can see where he is opening up that stem and has found that, that little larva inside that stem. So that, that little guy is going to be a problem. Uh, we don't have a really good way to control the larva. The other thing about it is it seems to be you know, one of these things that early season doesn't seem to be as bad. Later in the season seems to be a little bit worse. Uh, if you look out there and you're getting ready to cut your hay and you see those dead tops starting to show up, go ahead and cut the hay and bale it up because the, the best way to kill them is to cut and cure that hay because once that grass dries out, the larva dies. Uh, so that's the best way. If you're grazing, just keep on grazing it. The, the larva won't hurt the, the livestock at all. So uh, the best way is probably just to graze it. Have we showed this before? Okay, I'm not sure. I just want to make sure that you got this concept because now we're going to talk about protection from livestock because this is, you know, I mean, fall armyworms can eat you out of house and home. Grasshoppers can do the same thing, but livestock is, is one of our biggest problems. And many operations are overstocked, and a lot of times they don't realize it. And I want to show you this picture right here that I'm, we're looking at. There's no grass in that field whatsoever. The only thing that you see out there is kind of green and standing upright is goat weeds, woolly crow. And so you look at this. And this guy has a commercial cow-calf operation. Nothing special about the cows. No grass, the guy still has cows. This was taken during the drought of 2011. And so the question is, wow, what's happening out there? Because calf prices were not that good. He has uh, nothing for them to graze, so he's having to feed everything that they're getting. So he's having to buy expensive hay from out of state and bring that in. So the whole thing was just an environmental and uh, economical disaster uh, from all standpoints. So my statement that I've been using for many, many years is that I think the most critical factor in livestock production is the stocking rate. Uh, it doesn't matter what breed you've got or what part of the world you're in or any of those other things. If you've got the right stocking rate, almost any breed or kind of livestock can work for you and do well for you, but uh, the stocking rate is going to be the most critical factor. The reason is, is if we don't pay attention to the stocking rate and we start removing more and more of that leaf, removing more and more of that photosynthetic material, then look at the effect on, on root growth. And, you know, I showed that old SCS photo earlier when we were talking about the drought effect. So if you take off the top, you reduce the root. In fact, the range scientists have an old uh, kind of a rule of thumb, and, and they say if you uh, take the, the shoot, you kill the root, and that's exactly right. So you can see that we can remove up to about 50% of the leaf volume and have virtually no impact on root growth. But once you start removing more and more and more of that photosynthetic material, then you can actually completely stop root growth and production. So that's why, whether it's grasshoppers or fall armyworms or cattle or other livestock, that's why it's critically important to understand stocking rate and the effect on the plant, on the animal, on the pocketbook, and on the environment. So here's a picture, again, 2011. Well, here's another gas operation. You can see his pond level is just about gone back there. Again, nothing special about the cattle. Wasn't genetics. He'd been working on for 30 years. People that had that situation sent those cattle to Montana and, and other states where there was grass. But this, this fellow is hanging on, and, and it sort of indicates a type of grazing management philosophy, kind of a mindset on what he's thinking, and what he's thinking is he's wanting to use up every blade of grass that may possibly survive and, and get elevated and let the cattle come and take that. Nothing green in that picture. 
other than the leaves on the trees and weeds, bitter sneeze weed out there. Same day, same highway, same side of the highway, but about two miles up the road. Now here's a different guy with a totally different mindset. Because you can look, so number one, we can identify that's Bermuda grass, and we can probably figure that it's been fertilized because it still has some green in it, despite uh, how bad the drought situation was in this part of the state at that time. You can also look and see that he doesn't have any weeds in his pasture, and that tells me that he's also very interested in managing his weed population. So. There's not weeds out there getting the moisture, the very limited moisture. Weeds are not out there getting the sunlight. Weeds are not out there getting the nutrients. This guy has nothing but Bermuda grass, and he has not grazed it to the ground. Two totally different mindsets, two totally different approaches. And so when we think about those two type of guys, and so imagine two guys sitting in a coffee shop one morning, and there's a big rainfall event the night before. And so this one guy says, man, that was a great rain we had last night. And said, I emptied three inches out of my rain gauge this morning. And the other guy says, boy, I did too. I had the same three inches. Question is, if they have those two uh, opposite grazing management philosophies, who really got the effective three-inch rain? The guy that had no grass in the pasture or the guy that had grass in the pasture? Well, the rain science uh, Folks went out and, and actually determined that by obtaining some data one year. And so in January, and I'm told it was January 1, they went out and they sampled pastures, different people's pastures, to see how much residue, how much remaining forage was in this pasture on January 1. And so this one fella, the first one that we've highlighted there, had 100 pounds of dry matter per acre. That is virtually nothing left in the pasture. It looks like the first fella that we looked at a while ago, where there's no grass, only some weeds. All right, so the question is, a lot of times people say, well, what difference does it make? I mean, this is January. Grass is not growing. It's dormant. That's exactly right. But the amount of grass that's remaining in the pasture indicates this particular individual's grazing management philosophy or his mindset. And this particular individual tried to use every blade of grass that Mother Nature provided. Now, he received about 17 inches of rain that year, and for the total growing season, he grew 1,800 pounds of grass. All right, so let's compare him to another fella, the guy on the right-hand side. This guy had 1,500 pounds of forage in his pasture on January 1. And during the growing season, he only received about half as much rainfall. And yet he was able to produce almost 4,000 pounds of dry matter. So it's a riddle. And I ask people, how, how do you explain this riddle? How can I grow over twice as much grass with half as much water? It's interesting the response I get when, when we're out doing this, you know, face-to-face. Uh, -face. And so people say, well, they fertilize this. And no, that's, that's not really the answer. Well, they did this. Well, they did that. No, it's really, really simple, very simple. The guy on the right-hand side made his property a sponge. So he had limited rainfall that year. But it didn't all run off the side into the creek and, and into a reservoir and then finally down to the Gulf of Mexico. This guy had enough grass remaining in his pasture that what limited amount of rainfall he got, he slowed the overland flow velocity. He allowed that water to infiltrate into his soil. And he might not have only received but about 50% of that other fellas, but what he received, he got to keep and use. The other guy got almost twice as much rainfall, but because he didn't have any grass in the pasture, that water didn't stay in his pasture. It ran off the side into a creek, into a gully, somewhere else. He didn't get to use that water. It's a simple concept, and yet it's really hard to try to sell this idea that less is more 
when we're talking to a lot of producers. This is kind of what 100 pounds of dry matter per acre looks like. Virtually nothing on the ground. And look at how much bare soil is exposed. And so if we have a situation like this because we're overstocked, then that starts to lead to a lot of soil erosion. And the whole, one of the purposes of keeping enough grass in the pasture is to protect the soil resource. Because once you start losing that soil resource, there's not any reclaiming that. In fact, if you think about, if you've got bare soil, and the right hand, lower right hand photo there, it shows a crust. Everybody's familiar with what a crust on a soil looks like. But did you ever stop to think that the crust on the soil only forms on a bare soil. See, if we've got the soil covered up with grass, it's like a, a bunch of little umbrellas out there and it protects the soil from the effects of this raindrop impact because when the raindrop impacts that bare soil, you might have good soil structure, good particle size, but when the raindrop hits that soil, it takes those larger particles and blows them up, disintegrates them into these little tiny pieces that then seal the surface. That's what the crust is, is the sealing of that surface. Imagine how that impacts the rest of the rain that's coming. It's going to just run off the top, just like on a, on a tabletop or something. And so we tell people it takes maybe up to a thousand years to produce a top, an inch of topsoil. But then I, I ask them, well, maybe topsoil is not important. What do you think? Is topsoil important for forage production? And so then I show them this picture. And you can see where that plant that guy is looking at and it's pedestaled. And so you can see how much topsoil has been eroded from that particular site. Okay. But then we say, okay, how important is topsoil? Look what's growing around on the subsoil nothing. Now eventually things will start to grow there and it'll heal up in about 12 to 15,000 years. But because of mismanagement here, because we didn't leave grass in the pasture, because we didn't protect the soil from raindrop impact and overland flow and loss of soil due to erosion, water erosion, and it could be wind erosion too, uh, this is what we wind up with. And that site will never be as productive as it once was uh, for the people that first came and settled that country. But without adequate ground cover, besides losing topsoil, besides losing your water that you'd like to capture, you can lose your fertilizer nutrients. You can lose organic matter. Well, is that even important? Well, of course it is. And we can lose pesticides all going down into the water. We don't want any of these things to go into the water. But if we don't have adequate ground cover in the pasture, all of these things are going to wind up going into our water bodies and waterways in the state. So if we've got a bunch of water running off the field, one of the other issues that we run into is bacteria. And we're going around the state doing these Lone Star Healthy Stream programs and trying to alert producers, well, especially livestock producers, about the problems with bacteria. So we've got EPA and we've got the Clean Water Act, and that is a very per pervasive federal statute because it affects all of us. And it comes into Texas through TCEQ, and they go around and sample about 1,200 uh, water bodies, and every two years they got to do that, got to turn in a report to EPA. And the, the problem with this report is if any of your water bodies fail their designated use standard, they go on what's called a 303D list. And now we start to set in motion potential regulatory impacts in that watershed. Because once you're on the 303D list, you've got a certain amount of time to clean that water body up and restore it to its designated use standard or it becomes regulatory. You can do it voluntarily at first or regulatory. Of the 1,200 water bodies that are routinely sampled, 600 of them fail. 300 of those are for bacteria. It's the number one cause of water body impairment in the state of Texas. 
And so a lot of a lot of our producers are not aware that these things are taking place, these things are going on. And in the rural communities, the, if they find a water body that uh, has bacteria in it, the first people they point their finger at are the livestock producers. Now, livestock do contribute, but so do wildlife in a big way. And there's nothing we can do about the wildlife part of it. But we can stay out of trouble by just keeping grass in the pasture. So if you look at the bacteria impairments there on that top left-hand map, almost all of them, I mean, they're virtually all in the eastern half of the state because that's where the water is. It's where the creeks, the rivers, the, the uh, reservoirs are. And so we've got problems and lots of them, and we've got a lot of water bodies that are going to have to be cleaned up. But if we keep grass in the pasture, then we can feel certain that we are not contributing to the problem. We're actually helping to uh, protect the water bodies by doing the right thing. And by doing the right thing, when we're protecting the soil with keep, you know, with keeping enough forage residue in the pasture, then what we do is we protect uh, and, and enhance forage persistence and performance and vigor. We enhance animal performance and production. We enhance our pocketbook performance. And we also help protect the environment. So in summary, uh, what we'll say is that for range and pasture health considerations, water's number one. It's usually the first limiting factor to forage production. And that's one of those things that we, we don't have any control over how much water falls on our property, but we do have control over how much of that water we get to keep on our property and use on our property. If we have Bermuda grass of any kind uh, and or any sort of hay operation, doesn't matter what kind of forage uh, uh, species we're using for hay production, if we're in hay production or using Bermuda grass, we've got to use a soil test and make the, the right fertilizer uh, additions. And to do so, without a soil test is going to result in either under applying badly needed nutrients, over applying expensive nutrients that we might not have needed. And so the soil test is, is where we need to be thinking about that. And then we need to think about protection of our forage base. And that's protection from weeds, from winter pasture, from insects, and from grazing livestock. And so, again, maintaining the, the right amount of forage out there, that means using the right stocking rate, uh, all that is going to help us to protect our soil, capture and use our water, and protect the environment from all those, those runoff things. So with that, Pete, I will stop and see. Let's see, Dave's got a question here. Does keeping winter grass on the property mean that you should not burn in the winter? And so... If we're thinking about prescribed fire, uh, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Because if we're going to burn in the wintertime and we're going to get an immediate response or return of all of our phosphorus, potassium, a lot of the nitrogen is going to go back into the soil. If we're doing that every year, yeah, over time, then we're going to start losing more and more water and we're going to move a lot of those nutrients off the site. I recommend to people that they burn but we probably don't need to be burning these pastures every year. I think uh, there's there's some benefit to burning up that thatch every so often, get rid of some uh, insects or fungal organisms, things that may overwinter in that thatch. But I don't think we need to do it every year because if we do that, then we're taking a lot of the organic matter out of the, the, the situation there. And I think organic matter has uh, plays a big role. We need to remember that. Good question, Dave. Thanks. Anything else? It looks like Gerald's typing another question. As okay. he as he types a question, uh, got one more slide here. Yeah, I think. Uh, go ahead and put that up if people are interested in, uh, you know, looking at publications or whatever. Let's see, Gerald. If you have winter ribe in grace, how early can you sow summer Bermuda? Well, okay, so. The Bermuda grass seed is not going to germinate until soil temperatures are about 62 degrees. And so that goes back to that when the nights start to consistently be 60 degrees, 
then we can think about uh, getting that seed out. I would think in terms of backing up just a little bit, maybe a couple of weeks. So think about your last historical frost-free day or frost day, and think about trying to get that seed in the ground about that time. You'll be a little bit early, but it won't hurt anything to have the seed out there so that as those temperatures get up to the right point and that seed can germinate, you, you'll be ahead of that and you'll, you'll be out there. So it's going to depend on where you are in the state. Uh, if we're further north, it's going to be later. Further south, it's going to be earlier. If you're down there where Megan is, uh, they don't have winter time, so they can plant Bermuda grass in December if they want to and get away with it. See, Megan is typing something. She's going to correct me now. Oh, thank you, Megan. Yes. Yes, thank you for the uh, the advertisement there. Uh, yeah, ladies, we've got a, uh, a conference just for ladies. It's going to be in Fredericksburg, October 5th and 6th. Uh, Megan is going to be playing a big role in that, as is her counterpart in San Angelo, Morgan Russell. We're going to have some really cool lady ranchers, uh, ladies that are involved in estate planning and financing and you know, it's it's about women. There's more and more ladies uh, getting control of and managing properties, and so we we thought, may we needed a conference just to address their needs. So, yeah, if you're you're interested in that, uh, there's a link Megan has put in there. So, thanks, Megan. I appreciate you bringing that up. Yes, thank you. Just click on the link, and then I'll open a browser to that link. Uh, I'm gonna. I should. Y'all should be getting a survey. Uh, pop up on your screen. If you kind of lose the screen, you can go back and click on your little uh, green icon on the test board, come back to, to the to the Adobe Connect room. And I also put the link down here at the chat pod, so you can click on that and go to the survey. Uh, please take time to answer those questions. They help us, and the information is used for us to, uh, to use future uh, webinars and again I see some other people typing and, and while they type let me go ahead and just throw this in uh, Royal Company webinar is going to be October 1st it'll be one CEU IPM and the topic is going to be aquatic vegetation management and Dr. Todd Sink will be our speaker and uh, if you have not following us on Facebook you can actually follow us on Facebook at uh, www.facebook.com slash txrange and uh, we normally post uh, two postings a week, and we also announce the webinars and some other information on that uh, uh, Facebook page. So followers there. All right, Norman Gordon, is it hard to commit its pr producers to use herbicide, pesticide, as opposed to mowing and controlling? Time? You know, Norman, it depends on what their mindset is. You know, there's some people that have... Um, maybe, I'd say, abnormal fear of herbicides <coughs> because most of the herbicides, um, you know, unless you photosynthesize, they're pretty safe. But there are some people that just have an aversion to using those. And so it's very difficult to try to convince those people. And, you know, when I'm talking to somebody and, and they kind of throw that up in the beginning, I know, okay, th this is flogging a dead horse. I'll just talk to them about Go ahead and mow. It's going to cost more money, and, it, and it's not going to be near as effective. But if, if that's kind of their mindset, and, and I don't fault people for that. You know, I just, it's unfortunate that they don't understand maybe uh, the better living through chemistry, you know, that DuPont taught us. But, uh, yeah, so there there is some trouble trying to get them uh, to maybe use some of the herbicide. A lot of other people... Uh, are not nearly as resistant. A lot of people don't understand about herbicides that are available that they can use for, you know, whether it's brush or broadleaf uh, weed, something like that. So uh, it just kind of depends on who you're talking to. Some people it's easy. Grass-fed beef uh, producers typically use herbicides. Yes and no. It depends on 
organic is not okay so if you're trying to produce beef organically if you get into grass-fed natural those kinds of things there's not near the limitations on production uh, typically grass-fed you've got a and, and if you look there's different grass-fed organizations and so you go to one of those organizations and you look at what their requirements are and basically it's on grass-fed they got to be on grass you know they either have to be in the pasture or being fed hay or something like that and that's typically uh, about the only limitation sometimes you'll you'll run to where like on natural for example you can't use hormones uh, can't use antibiotics uh, those kinds of things but grass-fed is pretty open you know you can use a lot of a lot of our traditional tools Uh, Dr. Redmond, thank you for being here today and, and uh, given the being our speaker in this webinar. The, for those folks out there, this webinar is going to be recorded and will be on the website. So if you have anybody that's interested in listening to it, just point them to our website and they can listen to the webinar. All right. Well, thank you, Pete, for your help. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, sir. Very and much. thanks for our audience for coming today. You bet. Thank you all. So long.